بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين Now we move to discuss a few issues uh, during the minor occultation. Uh, the very fact that we had two different types of occultation. One occultation uh, in which there was an access to the Imam through intermediaries, the Nawab, and the other occultation which was the absolute disappearance of the Imam in a, in a way that no one had access to him to ask questions or whatever, uh, is something which was predicted by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Aimma salam about the, uh, the last Imam alayhi salam. And uh, of course, uh, there is a very rational philosophy behind it if we think about it. If Imam had just disappeared like that, then there would have been lots of doubts and suspicions and uh, whether the Imam at all was there, was he an Imam, was he not an Imam. So this interim period, the 70 years of minor occultation, in which the Imam was in contact and was not in contact with the Shia community, was uh, a sort of uh, preparation for, first of all, establishing the idea that the Imam can be there without you being able to have contact with him, and uh, the idea that uh, uh, you are going to be without an Imam after this for a long time. This was established somehow. However, establishing this idea was very difficult to convince the Shia community that this is the case was very difficult. Especially with the secretive nature of the whole event, uh, a big cloud of confusion was going around among the Shias. As I said, you should not compare yourself with the Shias of that time. You are very lucky, you know a lot. You have lots of traditions, you have the benefit of the hindsight. They didn't have this. Many of them didn't even know that the Imam was born. Now, I have uh, uh, brought uh, something uh, at the beginning of our discussion here about what happened to Shia after the demise of Imam Hassan al-Askari. It was not just that nice and neat thing that you know. Now, here... I have a book, this, this book is a very, very famous book. Of course, the English translation, Shia sect, is translated by our college and published by our college. But the book is written by one of the relatives of the third naib of uh, uh, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, Hassan ibn Musa al nubakhti Of course, when we come to Hussein ibn Ruh al nubakhti we'll discuss about him, the family of al nubakht this is one of the members of Al-Nubakh. The book is written during the minor occultation. Around, say for example, 20, 30 years after the disappearance of Imam alayhi salam, the book is written. Now, here, Hassan ibn Musa al-Nubakhti says that after the demise of Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam, the Shias were divided into 14 different divisions. This was unprecedented after the demise of any Imam, there might have been disagreements, so three, four groups came up. But 14 groups was really amazing. And this shows the amount of confusion which was going on uh, at the time of uh, that period, the, the era immediately after Hassan al-Askari Now, let's see what does he say. Now, the thick clouds, the thick clouds of confusion, of course, which was there. Going through this, one just cannot help themselves to appreciate and thank God that now we are not living in such a situation. And through what struggles the faith about the 12 Imams, 
had reached us. I mean, it was not just something very nice and neat coming through, unfolding in the history, no. It was a thorough struggle of Emma and their companions to establish this, especially because there were many vested interests around, which were uh, somehow uh, trying to bend the current of events towards themselves. And that's why you see after each Imam we had these divisions, for example after Imam al-Sadiq we had Fatahis, Nawusis, Ismailis, after Imam al-Kadhim we had Waqafis, and all these things of course all have died out. Except for Zaydis and Ismailis. These are the the faiths inside Shia divisions which have remained. Otherwise, all these 14 factions, the factions before them, they have all died. But it was a real struggle of the Imams and their followers, their companions, to really uh, somehow calm down the situation and impart this faith to us in this nice and neat way that we have it today, alhamdulillah. Now, Abu Muhammad Hassan ibn Musa al-Nawbakhti, or Nawbakhti, this is, this is the man. He, we don't know when did he die, between 300 to 310, sometimes around that time. And you know, the minor occultation took place 260, and it's extended until 329 for about 69 years or 70 years. So this is just in the middle of the minor occultation that he has written the book. He, he was actually one of the companions of Imam al-Askari salam. He was present after the Imam's demise and he was quite aware of the arguments and discussions which were going around among different factions. So that's why, of course very succinctly, but very nicely he had explained what happened after Imam al-Askari So, in his book Shia Sex, or Firaq al-Shia, he says that after Imam al-Askari, the Shia were divided to 14 divisions. Now, what were these 14? Some of these divisions are very difficult to figure out what they were saying because this is very, very old history. And he is very succinct. Some of them is difficult, really, to distinguish from others. But certainly there was something which he missed to write. And that's why we do not understand what some of these sects said. One sect said, the ele well, not sects, divisions. The eleventh man was alive and he was the Mahdi. Why did they say it? Anyone knows why did they say the eleventh man is alive and he is the Mahdi? Because they were not aware of a son born of Imam Askari. So, that secretive birth, it was not just secret for the caliphs or the Sunnis, it was secret for many Shias. When it is secret, it is secret. So, the Imam only disclosed this as much as it was necessary, so that it is not said that no child was born at all. However, the outer circles of Shias, Especially those Shias who were somehow uh, after their own vested interests, even when they were coming to Imam, they were completely unaware of such a child, a son born for Imam al Askari. And therefore, what should they say? They say, no, Imam is alive, otherwise the Shia faith is dead. If there is no son, and if Hazan al Askari is, is dead, then that means that's the end of Shia, that's the end of Imara. So they said, no, he is the Mahdi, and he's alive. Okay, they have vanished, of course, now. The other division, the 11th Imam died and came to life after his death, and he was the Mahdi. This was more like a Christian theory, resurrection after the death. Why they said he was, he died? Because no one could deny that. Because uh, the event in Samarra was witnessed not only by Caliph and the court, people of the court, but by anyone who was, who was there. Because Imam al was not a small figure. 
although he was in prison, also, or, although he was in, in the garrison, in the barrack, however, on the point of his death, it is said in the history that the whole Samarra was mobilized to come to take part in the funeral. So they, it was very difficult to deny that Imam al had died. However, what could they say if there was no child, if there was no son after him? He was resurrected. Maybe not three days as Jesus Christ, but some days after his death, death he was resurrected and he is the Mahdi. This is the second sect. Now, of course, the people who were saying this were not just ordinary lay people. They were otherwise, I mean, what lay people say would not stick into the history books. Only those prominent people whose views are considerable, their views would remain in history. Otherwise, other rumors or just uh, uh, chatters of people, they would disappear. So there were important people around this uh, Shia community in Samarra and all, uh, other places that they were saying these things. The names, some of the names are there, which are not important because the views are dead, the people are dead, and it's not important to know now who says what, who said what. Now, the second, the third view was that the Imam after Hassan ibn Ali is his brother Jafar, who was designated by his brother. This, of course, uh, was uh, a long-standing view in Shia, that a brother could appoint a brother. Uh, the Shias usually believe that after Hassan and Hussein alayhi salam, designation go from father to son, not from brother to brother. However, here, uh, the Fatahis, the long-standing Fatahis, and the view of Fatahiyya, who believe that the Imam after Musa al Kazim was Abdullah al Aftah, and after him he designated his brother Ja'far al Sadiq. And then the Imam continued Ja'far al Sadiq's uh, descendants. They were still around, the views were around, and they said in the same way, the Fatahis, in the same way that Abdullah al Aftah, the son of Imam Baghr alayhi salam, Sorry, the son of Imam Sadiq who appointed his brother Musa al-Kazim. The son of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam appointed his brother Ja'far. Here, Hassan al-Askari appointed his brother Ja'far as well. So we had two Ja'fars appointed by their brothers. Now, however, this view was very difficult to accept by the majority of the Shia because Ja'far was a licentious person. No one could have believed that Jafar could be, be an Imam. Therefore, this was a very, very minority circle. Others had other views. So this is the third view. And of course, the Jafar did many evil things immediately after the claiming Imam for himself that everyone dispersed from around him. The fourth view was that the Imam after Hassan ibn Ali is his brother Jafar who was not designated by his brother, who was designated by his father. Therefore, Imam al-Askari was an imposter. So he claimed Imam for himself, Jafar remained silent until al-Askari died, and then Jafar claimed Imam as it belonged to him. So they were against Imam Hassan al-Askari right from the beginning. Now, the fifth group, neither Hassan ibn Ali nor Ja'far ibn Ali were Imams. But the Imam was their brother Muhammad ibn Ali, who had died in his father's lifetime, and he is the Mahdi. Now this is very interesting. So, Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam had three sons, Muhammad, Ali, Hassan, Muhammad, Hassan, and Ja'far. Now, Hassan and Jafar, they claimed Imam, but they were not Imams. The Imam was Muhammad, who had died before them, and he was the Mahdi, and he will come back. Now, of course, if you want to analyze the history, we can find out why these sort of uh, factions were fighting with these type of views. 
I mean, some accepted Jafar, some were rejecting both Jafar and Hassan, some were accepting both Jafar and Hassan in a different Hassan in a different way. So to go into the depth of it, we can analyze why historically they had said these things. Now the sixth group, the Imam, the eleventh Imam openly had a son whom he named Muhammad and he is the Mahdi. Now this was very difficult to say because he never had opened the son. The son was quite a secret uh, issue which was not known, but they just wanted to establish that there is a Mahdi who is son of Imam al-Askari and they, they used to say, no, he openly had a son. Imam al-Askari had a son who was born eight months after his death and he is the Mahdi. Those who say, who say that he had a son during his life are liars. Now this is probably due to the fact that after his demise, one of her slave maidens, who of course was his wife, just to protect the Mahdi salam, she said that I'm pregnant. And therefore all focus was on her. And she was kept under surveillance to see when this child was going to be born. But after eight months, this uh, revolt of the black slaves happened and the whole attention of the court was taken towards them and the lady was released and these people said the lady when she was released she gave birth to that child and that child is Mahdi why they said that because it was not proven for them that Mahdi was born at the time of Hassan al-Askari they said we don't know anything about about it Imam did not tell us anything if he had told other people, so that's their uh, conviction that they have to follow. The eighth group say the Imam had no son at all. They don't say anything. Well, now here, no Baptist doesn't say anything about anything more than that, and we don't know what really these people said. The ninth group, the Imam, are terminated by the death of the eleventh Imam. The earth is left without an Imam until Allah wills to send al-Mahdi. Now this was a complete revolt against the Shia belief that the earth cannot be left without an Imam. Now they had long justifications. They said yes, the earth cannot be left without an Imam unless the sins grow. And because the sins have grown, Allah had withdrawn the Imam, the Hujjah from the earth, and therefore there is no Hujjah until the day when Mahdi comes. And we don't know who the Mahdi is, whose son Mahdi is going to be. The other group were Nafisiyya. These were the followers of a servant called Nafis. Now this is a very interesting view. Imam al-Hadi designated his son Muhammad, not Hassan. Muhammad who had died in his life, right? When Muhammad was dying, he could not designate his father again. No, he was the Imam, he was designated Imam. But he was dying, he couldn't designate his father again. There was no one to designate. So he designated a young servant called Nafis and transferred all the bequests to him and asked him to give them to Jafar should anything happen to his father. This is, this is a very convoluted way of argument, of course. It's very difficult to understand on what basis these uh, were, were said and they had long arguments for example they said when Hussein ibn Ali was leaving for uh, Karbala for Kufa he left all the bequests of Imam to Umm Salama to give it back to Imam Zainul Abidin after he comes back from uh, from Kufa and the same thing was here of, of course neither Nafis is comparable to Umm Salama nor Jafar is comparable to Imam Hussein salam, but they made all these sort of uh, uh, arguments for their cause and therefore Nafis was an interim sort of Imam, a trusted person to whom the, uh, the whole issue of Imam was trusted and he gave it to Jafar the 11th group, they don't know who the Imam is after Al-Hassan, although they believe there should be an Imam. This was a good, of course, very right, night and neat. We don't know who's the Imam, that's all. Uh, now, the 12th group, he says that they were the mainstream Shia, and he brings lots of arguments 
in their favor, because he was of the mainstream Shia, of course. What we believe now, he says that why they believed in such and such, what were the proofs, what was the evidence, and all these things he mentioned. The imama was transferred to Jafar after Hassan al-Askari because he had no progeny, not because brother could, it was just of, out of exigency. And the 14th group, the Imam after Imam al Askari is his son Muhammad and he is the awaited Mahdi. However, he died and he will return one day to fill the earth with justice. Well, we don't know again why they said this. Maybe they just wanted to cover, to protect, or whatever. We don't know. Now, why I mentioned all these useless uh, issues here, just to somehow put ourselves in the context of the Nawab, of the time of the Nawab. And how could they de deal with such an uh, environment, with such very, very bitter trends, and they were really fighting with each other for, for these. How could they calm down the situation and establish that, yes, Mahdi was born, he is in hiding, he will come one day, and you, you know all these other 13 are now completely, have now completely disappeared. It's only that one issue which was certainly the issue of uh, uh, the, the, the idea that Mahdi was born and he is in hiding, which remained. Now, I want to ask you, One question. In such a cloud environment, how did the deputies manage to establish themselves? It's very difficult. Can you imagine an answer for this? You know, still we have today people, Shias, who say that this whole idea of deputies and these things is just a fake sort of story made by the Nawab, the idea of Mahdi born, being in hiding, made by the Nawab, so that they collect homes for themselves. Of course, to be naive of the Imam meant that everyone would take the homes to them, isn't it? And the homes was quite a considerable amount of money at that time. At the time of al Hadi only the homes of Bahrain for one group of people in Bahrain, one of the wakala of Imam al-Hadi was bringing the homes of Bahrain, it was 80,000 dinar. That was a lot. And that shows how Shias were great in number and well-to-do people. So, this whole idea of being a naib meant that, of course, all these homes was coming to them. And they had to pump that certainly with the permission of the Imam into the Shia community. But what if it is all a story? It was not just, it was not pumping it to the Shia community. It was just, they were collecting the homes for themselves. And they made up the, the whole story to say that, to, to, to convince people to bring them this money. What do you say? What's the answer to this? So you accept it. The, the answer is, they were not the only people who were after the Homs, if they were after the Homs. There were all these 14 factions, first of all. And the Shias were not fool people to bring their Homs to people not knowing what they were doing. And the scholars around the world were not just a stupid ulama, so to speak, to encourage people to take homes to these people without knowing what is behind it. And therefore, it is very, very hard or silly for a person to say such a thing. It's insulting all those scholars, intelligent people, ministers, vazis, and all these people who were around as Shia at that time. Just thinking that they were so full to give their homes to anyone who claimed that I am naive of the Imam. That's 
That's one issue. This, uh, if you go to the internet, Al Khatib and others, you see these people are spreading these views, certainly. However, what is important here for us is that uh, what the strategy these Nawab took to establish the mainstream idea that all these other groups are wrong. Of course, they were not bellicose coming out fighting or something like that. All these discussions were secretly going in the Shia network, underground network. Shia underground network is not something appearing on, on the surface. How could they convince all other factions? And certainly, of course, great Shia scholars, they were unanimous accepting their authority. Except six of them that we will discuss, who claimed the deputyship for themselves. Well, it is said they were six. They were certainly less than that. Some, some, some of them, uh, their claim for deputyship is exaggerated in the sense that they said something else and people said that you are claiming deputyship for the Imam alayhi salam. So, uh, there was this consensus, this is very important, this consensus among all Shia scholars. Scholars were very important because they were not people to be fooled by emotions. As soon as someone saying, I am in contact with the Imam, or I am the Naib of the Imam, they accept it and say, yes, so, like some of our youngest, youngsters today, they just get fooled by some people saying, we are in touch, or we are in great sort of uh, spiritual uh, contact with some uh, mawali of the Imam, so to speak. They, 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 these scholars were really tough. I mean, you read some of their books, they did not accept things just f on the basis of a tradition or something heard here or someone said something that, no, they were really following the evidence and truth. So the very fact that the scholars had the consensus shows it's an evidence that they were truthful, these Nawal. It was very difficult because, you see, when I claim that I'm in touch with the Imam, and no one else can go and ask him whether this man is your nab or not, it's very difficult to prove this claim. So they should have had real evidence that we are the Nawab of the Imam, so that the scholars would have accepted that yes, you are right. We accept, we agree that you are in contact with the Imam, although we cannot go to him and ask him whether you are a nab or not. So the task was very complicated, confounded, and difficult for these Nawab. Now, some reports indicate that for about two years after the demise of, the, of Imam al-Askari, still the Shia referred to Imam Askari's mother, and not because the Naib had not yet established himself, the first Naib had not yet established himself. So still they were looking for another source to listen to uh, uh, as, as a mediator between them and the Imam. Now, of course, Imam Askar's mother, Khodeis, or Susan, of course, you know, the ladies had a name before marriage and after marriage, one name after marriage, and this, is, this was a habit. So that's why all wives of Aimma, the Prophet, they had two names, one name before marriage and one name after marriage. So I think Hodeis should be the name before marriage, Susan should be the name after marriage. For various issues, and uh, Sheikh Sadduq reports from Ahmad ibn Ibrahim saying, I visited Hakima. Hakima was the aunt of Imam al Askari, daughter of Imam al Jawad, in the year 262. This is two years after the demise of Imam al Askari and the beginning of the minor occultation, and talked to her from behind a veil. I asked her about her views regarding the Imams. So this Ahmad ibn Ibrahim still is looking for the truth, to find out what is the reality about this issue of Imams. And she named them one by one, including Al-Hujjah ibn al-Hassan al-Askari. I asked her, where is this son now? 
And she said, he is in hiding. I said, so the Shia should turn to who? If he is in hiding, who should we go and ask our questions? She said, to the grandmother, Jadda. And that's why this Jadda, the, uh, the, the Jadda means grandmother. And you come across this Jadda in many traditions that people actually referred for many issues to Jadda. And this was just like, as we said, people were referred to Zainab alayha, for example, after Hussein for a while, until Imam Zainul Abidin was well and established himself. And now people refer to Jadda uh, until the first Naab could establish himself. And of course, these Naibs were supported by Jadda, they were supported by Hakima, they were supported by close relatives of the house of uh, Imam al Askari, except for Jafar, of course. And this was another evidence for the people that these were the truthful Nawab of Imam alayhi salam. She added that this was, this was an order from Imam al Askari following the example of Al Hussein alayhi salam. As I said, Al Hussein alayhi salam uh, referred everyone immediately what to do immediately after his demise, his martyrdom, to refer to Zainab alayhi salam. So Hakima says Hassan al Askari alayhi salam has done the same thing, referring everyone to his mother until things are established, the clouds of confusion are away. Now, Jadda had this role until the first deputy of Uthman ibn Sayyid established himself, certainly. Apart from the opinions on the, uh, on the Imam, Imama, sorry there was a misspelling here, there were additional disputes about the deputy. However, the clouds were cleared gradually. Now, the four deputies who undisputedly could establish themselves, when I say without dispute, without dispute among the scholars. The scholars agreed, the evidence they provided was sufficient for them, that they were the deputies without them being able to refer to Imam alayhi salam as he was in hiding. The four deputies of the Imam in the period of minor occultation were Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri al-Samman, who was already a representative of the 10th and 11th Imam. So he was a very respectful Shia uh, personality. There were occasions where Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari were asked about a trusted person to whom she, on whom Shia could rely and to whom they could refer, and they had referred them to Uthman ibn Sa'id, actually preparing, in the hindsight we can understand, preparing the Shias to respect this man as a deputy of Imam. Then his son Muhammad ibn Osman ibn Sa'id, who died 305, he was the author of a number of books in Fiqh and Hadith, which he reported from the 11th and the 12th Imams, and also from his, his father. Then we have Hussein ibn Ruh al nawbakhti and Ali ibn Muhammad as samuri who was deputy only for three years, and he was the last deputy. Now, the most important and crucial role, the L is missing here, of the deputies, was to establish the idea of occultation. That the Imam can be there, but the Shias could not see him. This was very important. As I said, if we just jumped into the major occultation, it was very difficult to find out what has happened. Here, in this interim 70 years, the idea of occultation gradually was absorbed by the Shias. That this can be the case that they can live without an Imam, although the Imam is there. But of course, as I mentioned before, even the period of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari was a preparatory period. That there was very, very limited access to them. However, here there was no access at all in this interim time, unless through a representative, an intermediary, 
And therefore, this was a very crucial moment for Shias, period for Shias, to establish this idea of occultation. Why was this period needed before the absolute disappearance? Well, I, I answered the question. I just wanted to ask you, but I have rushed answering it all through. Now, other more routine responsibilities of the deputies were to act as mediator between the Imam and the Shia, taking the correspondence to the Imam and bringing the answers, collecting the homes, spending it under the orders of the Imam, how this should be pumped to the Shia community at the time, and uh, just these routine responsibilities that they had. However, you can imagine at, the, at that time where Imam was not accessible, of course they took, assumed the role of the heart of the community, these Nawab. So it was a very great task. And it, it makes the whole scenario more attractive, knowing that all these things were going in secret. I mean, no one in Baghdad knew, except those close circle Shias, who is, what is the meaning of a Nile? Who is the Nile? No one knew. I mean, they were living just as ordinary people. They, they had their own businesses and all these things. No one knew about it. This is a very attractive sort of a story when we look into it, the, the secretive side and then the, uh, the challenges that they faced, the way they prepared the community. Now, this mediation created its own language. It's very interesting. Now we use many jar jargons about Imam al as which was created at that time. A number of terms were coined to refer to the Imam and his correspondence. Because of course they couldn't just, I mean, he was, uh, if uh, uh, Uthman ibn Sa'id was sitting in his shop, for example, someone coming and telling him, take this to Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. <laughs> that was the end of Muhammad ibn Uthman and, the, and all the Shia community there. So they had to have a secretive sort of terminology for themselves to use amongst each other. Now the terminology are very familiar for you now, it's not secretive at all. When they are said, we know what is meant by it, but at, but at that time it was quite a sort of uh, exclusive type of language. As-Sayyid, Al-Alim, these were the terms they used to refer to Mahdi alayhi salam. So when they say Al-Alim, of course, everyone could have thought this, this is an alim in, in Baghdad or in Samira or whatever. An Nahiyatul Muqaddasah. Now we say Ziyaratul Nahiyah, isn't it? We have Ziyaratul Nahiyah. Nahiyah means uh, direction. And that is, we mean direction of the Imam, but they just use this direction. Okay, can you take this to, direct, to the direction? Okay, no one knew what this meant. Can you take this to Anahia? No one meant. Al Gharim. Gharim is someone to whom you owe. And because they owed homes to Imam, they, these, especially when it, it came to money and business, they called Imam Al Gharim. So you owe to him, you have to pay your homes to him. He was also called a Sahib. Now, when we say a Sahib, all of us know what is, was meant by it. But at that time, not many people knew what, it, what is meant by a sahib, the companion, for example. Sahib al-Dar, owner of the house. Sahib al-Asr, the companion of the time. Wali al-Asr, Wali al-Amr. These were the sort of uh, uh, terms. His letters were called a tawqi, which simply means signature. Now, a tawqi has come from the Nahia. Now, you see, this is a very secretive language, isn't it? A signature has come from the direction. Now, if you are not aware, if you are not into the inner circle of the, uh, of the Shia, you don't, you don't understand what does it mean. A signature has come, for example. And by signature, they meant the letter, which has the seal or the signature of the Imam on it. And this was a very important issue because these deputies were bringing the letters of Imam. And it, the, the letters should have been in Imam's own handwriting. The scholar demanded that. That whenever we ask you something, you bring us a letter from Imam. I want it, we want it to be in Imam's handwriting. And uh, how did they know what was the Imam's handwriting? Now, these scholars were very clear, clever, as I said. 
They were not to be fooled very easily. They had letters from Imam al Askari. And the letters, they said, if Imam could produce letters with this handwriting, we accept it. Otherwise, we don't. And these Tawriyat came with the handwriting of the Imam to them. And it was in that way that they believed that this is from the Imam. Of course, sometimes uh, there was not a, a Tawriyat coming from the Imam. The answers came from the deputies themselves. And you see, it was due to the status of the scholar as well. Sometimes the scholar was not so uh, lucky to get the direct answer from the Imam. The deputies just conveyed the, the answers. One of the scholars, I don't remember his name now, he asked uh, something, he wrote a letter to the Imam through the deputy and he wanted the response and it was delayed. Someone advised him, don't be sad, this is good, because that means the Imam is going to answer your letter rather than the deputy himself. And this delay is because probably the Imam is not available at the moment, the deputy cannot see him now, and that's why the, the answer is delayed. Now, all these terms were coined because of taqiyah, of course, as I said. It was the very strict taqiyah, uh, which had to be observed. Now, the first deputy, let's look at the personality of, of some of these, of, of all the four deputies, of course. They are not too numerous. So, Abu Amr Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, he was a resident of Samarra. I don't know whether he was born in Samarra of, or not. I, 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 I have not found out. But he was long a resident of Samarra. During the Imam al-Hadi, when he moved to Samarra, he was there. During the whole life of Imam al-Askari, he was there. And he was in contact with them. And was one of the most reliable wakils of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari. So, it was quite plausible that after the demise, people could have relied on him as whatever he said. Imam al-Hadi used to say his companions that, to his companions, that Abu Amr is a trustworthy man, and whatever he tells you is on my behalf. So, he speaks on my behalf. It was Uthman ibn Said who did the ghusl and kafan of Imam al-Askari in public. Now, we believe that the ghusl and kafan of an Imam should be performed by another Imam, and that, that's why we say that Imam al Mahdi salam himself was there. But there were two ghusl and kafan. One which was done in secret by Imam, of course, the five-year-old boy. And the other one, because he was a prominent man of Ahlul Bayt, he was the Imam of the Shia, everyone, of course, respected him. Therefore, he should have, been, he should have had a Ghoslan Kafan in public. And he, it was this Abu Amr Uthman ibn Said who did that. And this, of course, shows the, where he stood in relation to the Imam. Uh, he was the head of all the deputies of the 11th Imam. So, just as, like a, a first minister of Imam al Askari. He had a great role in convincing the Shias against the other 13 parties that the Imam was Muhammad ibn al Hassan, and he had to remain in occultation to protect himself. It was a difficult task, of course, as I said, in the face of all those oppositions. If it was not for his position with the 10th and 11th Imams, he could not accomplish this job, certainly. Shortly after the demise of the Imam, Al-Amri moved to Baghdad and chose Karh as the place of his headquarters. And he died there before 267. When I say before, it means that we don't know exactly what date he passed away. So, by the deputyship of uh, uh, Uthman, the headquarters of Shia was moved to Baghdad again. There was no point to, to remain in Samarra anymore. So, and Baghdad was the place of the whole literary, cultural, and scientific achievements of the Muslim community and more, 
prominent Shia scholars were residing there, so there was no point that Amri stayed in Samarra anymore. He was in Samarra because of the Imam. And now that the Imam has passed away, there was no point for him to remain in Samarra, so he moved to Baghdad. And thereafter, all the deputies of the Imam lived and passed away in Baghdad, all of them. So the headquarters of the Shia was in Baghdad at the time. To conceal his underground activities, he used to sell olive oil. And for that he was called Samman or Zayat. Uthman ibn Sa'id as Samman. Sam, Sam is, uh, is oil and Zayt is also oil. And he did this so skillfully that he received orders from the army for their olive, for the oil provision. So he was a rich man by getting orders from the army, selling oil to them. And suddenly if they knew that he is a Shia, they never would have orders to, to buy oil from him. So you see how secretly they were keeping the whole faith and the whole issue. It's not imaginable to think that the head of a Shia, head of the Shia community, was, did have a shop which the army thought that this is the best place to buy their provisions from. However, there was another thing. He sold the oil, olive oil to the army, but he used to carry the homes and other trusted material to the imam in those big oil jar, jars, which was now, which returned to, uh, returning to him empty, so he used to use that to take them to Imam's house. Uh, probably his business with the army somehow protected him from lots of many suspicions that people might have had about him. And uh, uh, it's really nice to make a film about this. I mean, it's very interesting. The way these people could keep the secrets to this extent, and then be in touch with the whole Shia community, with all the scholars, without anyone knowing what's going on in this shop. Okay. And that they were not coward people, certainly, because otherwise they could have said to everyone, no, no, don't, don't, don't come close, don't. No, they were very uh, brave people, but at the same time very cautious, very tactful in keeping this secret. The second deputy, Muhammad ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id, this was the first deputy's son. And of course, he was his son and he was a respected scholar and he was a respected person by Imam al-Askari as well. Even during the lifetime of Imam al-Askari, he was very respected by him. According to a report, his name was mentioned by Imam al-Askari as the deputy of the 12th Imam. Now that report, uh, because uh, it doesn't have a very strong chain. I, I didn't want to bring it here. But the report says that uh, Uthman ibn Sa'id will be my, is my deputy and his son is the deputy of Al-Mahdi. This is what the report says about uh, Muhammad ibn Uthman. He had the longest period of deputyship, almost 40 years, and he died in 305 and was buried in Baghdad. And... Uh, this long period tempted some Shia prominent personalities to claim deputyship for themselves. And to prove them wrong, he needed some unusual proofs like foretelling many events through the knowledge of the Imam, which people asked him about it. Now, this uh, the issue of uh, claimants of deputyship, some of them came up because still the outer uh, circle of the Shia community, they did not know who's the Naib. And uh, this secret even was not conveyed to the outer circle. And therefore it was very easy to cheat people by saying that I'm the Naib of the Imam. And some of them, however, some of these people were really, really uh, prominent Shia scholars. And by that they were, they hoped that they could somehow attract people to themselves, attract homes, probably. We don't know what were their intentions for, for claiming deputyship to the Imam. 
Now, the six people mentioned uh, who claimed deputyship during the time of Muhammad ibn Uthman and his uh, successor Hussein ibn Ruh are Ahmad ibn Hilal al Abartai, who was called al Hilali, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Bilal, Muhammad ibn Nasir al Numeri. Also, the name of Hallaj is mentioned, Hussein ibn Mansur al Hallaj. This is the famous Hallaj, a mystic, who was, uh, who was uh, executed by the Abbasid uh, government. Uh, it's very doubtful, really, what he claimed. Did he really claim to be a deputy of the Imam? Or his uh, very vague type of language, uh, uh, ambiguous language, uh, has uh, led some people to think that he claimed deputyship. Abu Muhammad al-Hassan al-Sari'i and Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abil Azagir al-Shalmaghani. Now, this Shalmaghani is very famous. I'll talk about him later. But, as you can imagine, these were not ordinary people. These were certainly scholars, companions of the Imams, Al-Hadi and Al-Askari alayhim salam They were people who considerably could have attracted attention. And uh, it's unfortunate that such people with that long-standing respect in Shia community came out to try trying to uh, somehow uh, put themselves in place of a deputy of the Imam. Jealousy or ambitions or even sometimes self-deceit that people thought that I have such a position. What's my difference with Muhammad ibn Uthman? He's, he had been a companion, I have been a companion. Especially about Shalmaghani, he had written many books of hadith from Imam al-Askari and Imam al-Hadi and even some people after he claimed to be deputy they came to uh, Muhammad ibn Uthman and uh, to Hussein ibn Ru and said what should we do? Our houses are full of books of Shalmaghani we used to pray with these books we used to fast with the help of these books. Now, what should we do? He, he claims to be a deputy. You say that he's not a deputy. And if he's a liar, should we follow the, uh, the books that we have been reading from them? Which, of course, the answer came from the Imam salam that, yes, the books, they reported rightly. They were scholars. They were good people. Suddenly, they have changed. And so, the same thing which was said about uh, the Fatahis, Take what they have reported and leave what they believe in. They leave the claims and everything. The latter was one of the most prominent Shia scholars who had compiled several books of hadith. However, he fell out with the third deputy, Hussein ibn Ru, and claimed deputyship for himself. It's not well, of course, we could go into details of why he fell out with Hussein ibn Ruh, what was the dispute, what was the argument. Uh, but it's not important now, everything is just a past history. Abu al Qasim Hussein ibn Nuh, sorry, it should be Hussein ibn Ruh, Nawbakhti. Now, Nawbakhti, if you remember, I said this book is written by Hassan ibn Musa Nawbakhti. This Al Nubakh, Nubakhti family were an Iranian family, quite educated, very clever people, and as soon as they established themselves in Baghdad, they were somehow sought by the, the Abbasid court because of their expertise, their knowledge. So some of them became wazirs, some of them became advisors, but the majority of them almost all of them were Shias. It was a, fa a sort of family faith. And this uh, Hussein ibn Nuh al-Nubakhli was one of them. So originally he was an Iranian, but of course they had long moved to Baghdad. After Abu Sahl al-Nubakhli, Abu Sahl al-Nubakhli is the most prominent of uh, these uh, al Nubakht. He was the most renowned member of Banu Nubakht family. He was the deputy from 305 to 326. That's for 21 years. 
Banu Nubah were a famous Iranian family in Baghdad. After their conversion to Islam, they were taken into the Abbasid court due to their scholarly talent. Some members of this family were appointed as wazirs. Hassan ibn Musa Nubahti, the great Shiite philosopher and theologian, and Abu Sahl al Nubahti, the great theologian of Baghdad, were from this family. And therefore, Hussein ibn Ruh uh, was not only someone backed by the previous Nawab, designated by them. Now, the task of the second Naib onward was much easier than the task of the first Naib, because they were designated. I mean, on, the, on their demise, the Shia scholars came together and they designated who is my successor under, of course, orders of the Imam alayhi salam, who is going to be the Naib after me. So it was very easy. It was the most important and difficult task was for the first the deputy to establish himself as the deputy. Hussein ibn Ruh was a wakil of Muhammad ibn Uthman in Baghdad, along with nine other persons. Muhammad ibn Uthman, which was the, who was the second deputy. However, he was chosen by the Imam as the deputy after Muhammad ibn Uthman. He was both a theologian and jurist, and was one of the cleverest and wisest scholars of his time. He died in Baghdad in 326 and was buried in the Nubakhtiya area. Of course, you cannot find Nubakhtiya area in Baghdad now. The fourth deputy, Ali ibn Muhammad al Samuri. He was a companion of Imam al Askari and was chosen by the Imam as the deputy in 326. He was in the post for three years. Uh, certainly, of course, the more we come forward, the older these companions of Imam al-Askari would become. And therefore, he lived only three years. And it was uh, probably not possible otherwise for Imam al-Mahdi al -Islam to choose a deputy who was not a companion of his father. So you would see that all his deputies were companions of his father and of his grandfather, as in the case of the first two. He passed away in the year 329, which was called the year of Tanathur al Nujum. The year 329 was the most bitter year for the Shia, because many bitter things happened. The Imam went into complete occultation. That was the first very bitter thing in 329. Ali ibn Muhammad al Samuri, the head of the Shia, passed away. Kolaini, the most prominent Shia scholar, passed away. Uh, Ali ibn Babway, father of Sheikh al Sadu, passed away, along with some other scholars. And so this is called the year where the stars went, uh, the stars scattered out and disappeared. The year of the disappearance of the stars, Tanathur al Nujum. And, of course, he was buried in Baghdad. So, remember this 329, which is the most bitter year for the Shia, after the Imam, alayhi salam. Six days before his death, he received a tawqi. Now, you know what tawqi is now. From the Imam. Now, what was the tawqi? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samuri. أعظم الله أجر إخوانك فيك فإنك ميت ما بينك وبين ستة أيام. أو علي بن محمد السمري. May Allah increase the reward of your brethren in you. That means you are going to die. Your brothers are going to be rewarded by God for their patience. May Allah gives them abundant reward. For you will die within six days. Therefore prepare. But do not make a will for anyone to take your place after you. The second occultation is now taking place. Now, of course, at that time, it was not said minor occultation and major occultation. It was said first occultation and second occultation. That's why the Imam says, uh, Now the second ghayba has taken place. There will be no appearance except after the permission of God. And this will be after a long time and hardening of the hearts and the spread of injustice. Some of my Shia will come 
and claim seeing me. Beware whoever claims seeing me before the advent of Sufyani and the Sayha. These are the two signs of the advent of the Imam, which we'll discuss later, is a liar. Now, this, this statement, of course, this is the most famous statement of the second occultation by the Imam alayhi salam. At the end, there is something very, very important, and that's why we are confused about it. People say that we have seen the Imam here. Imam says, whoever claimed that has seen me is a liar. Some of my Shia will come and claim seeing me. Beware. Whoever claims seeing me before the advent of Sufyani and the Sayha is a liar. Now, the scholars have uh, uh, had a hard time to conceal to make conciliation between this statement and the statement of some of the most trusted people who say that we have seen the Imam. And that's why they have, uh, well, some of them have said that uh, they have thought. It's, it's not possible. Imam says, whoever claims, we respect these scholars. If we do not respect them, we say they are liars. But since we respect them, we say that they have thought that they have seen the Imam. However, some others have uh, been more respectful to some of those scholars or uh, spiritual people who have said that they have seen the Imam. They say that when Imam mentions this, he wants to uproot the claims of deputyship after himself. So anyone coming, claiming that he is a contact with me, he is mediating between me, between me and the people. He brings messages from me. That is very interesting because now there are many people in Iran who, who claim that they, 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 they are in contact and they bring messages from Imam to people. That's very interesting. I don't know whether you have seen the film or not, that one, one of such people claimed that the Imam uh, actually comes and lead them in prayer. And therefore, if you see the film, it's very funny. They all stand in a line and there is an empty sajada in the front. And then they, they pray. And the man who claims that he sees the imam, he says that, yes, he's down in ruku, Allahu Akbar, go to ruku, Allahu Akbar, go to sujood. He sees them going to ruku and sujood and others don't see him. Now, it's very interesting. So, these sort of claims that people can see him and mediate between him and the people or can bring a message from him to... I mean, these messages were not easy to get from the Imam, even this, at the time of the uh, minor occultation, you had to wait for long times to get a response from the Imam, long time in the sense that you had to take your letter, uh, get it to the Naib, and uh, sometimes, of course, the, the, the response came immediately, sometimes there was long time they had to wait. However, these claims that people sometimes make that uh, they bring messages from the Imam to other people, Imam said this, Imam said that, certainly, absolutely, they lie. Now, I don't know, because there are some reports from reliable people, I don't know what to do, I'm confused. One of those 14, <laughs> now, <laughs> what to do? But uh, to be on the safe side, to be on the safe side, we do not believe anything as a message from Imam alayhi salam. Or that Imam said to do this. Imam said, when is he going to come? Well, this is very clear because he himself doesn't know when he is going to come. According to all those traditions that we, we learned. Or, for example, Imam said, you do this so that I come earlier. Again, people claim that we saw the Imam and the Imam said, do it such and such so that my Faraj comes closer. Anyone, we do not deny now, okay, we do not deny that people may see the Imam. And usually it happens that when they see the Imam, they do not recognize him. Afterwards, they, they think that he was the Imam. But even if that is the case, no exchange of messages, certainly, from the Imam to people or from the people to the Imam. So, at the end, this is the last, of course, the last topi, the last sentence from Imam uh, Al-Mahdi that uh, 
وسياتي شيعتي ماي شيعاس so he he of course admits that these are from the shi'as who claim this وسياتي شيعتي من يدعي المشاهدة مشاهدة means just seeing this is very clear from among my shia will come those who claim that they see me ألا فمن ادعى المشاهدة قبل خروج السفياني والسيحة فهو كاذب مفتر he makes lies whoever be- believes in that ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم this is in Kamal al-Din of Saduq questions so we are done with the minor occultation then inshallah we move to of course major occultation has nothing to say we are living in the major occultation so we move to the signs of the zuhur for reappearance inshallah okay uh, brothers and sisters uh, we have got only two floating mics and two wired mics uh, can we start with the sisters first uh, if they are ready uh, any sisters? Yeah, go on. No, I oh, know it's becoming very interesting. Okay, brothers, uh, Firoz, can you pass the mic to Firoz there? Um. You mentioned uh, during your talk that uh, there were many prominent scholars uh, who claimed deputyship and they'd written, you mentioned one who had written books and things like that and you mentioned some of the reasons that might they have led them to do that, you know, you mentioned various reasons. The thing that comes to my mind is that it's, this problem is not just related to the time of the Imam of the occultation. It is also possible in our time that we could have scholars, God forbid, who are prominent, who are spies, who have done a lot of work, and for various reasons might then do things that might not necessarily be right. Uh, so how do we deal with that? You know, this idea of that, 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 that you cannot be somehow be misguided because at the end of the day in the occultation of the Imam which we are we have no way of absolute authority or confirmation if we suspect that there is something there I'm not talking about minor issues I'm talking about major issues sometimes you think that are we on the right path or is this the way forward you know and 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 uh, I'm just an ordinary person I'm not a scholar so I can just theorize these sort of issues that sometimes crop in my mind and I don't maybe you know if you understand what I'm trying to yeah, say. To, to always uh, follow the right path uh, of course we need good scholars to guide us to the right path but uh, we have to have some sort of judicious uh, mind ourselves as well to find out if someone is saying something is it according to first of all standards of intellect and reason sound understanding and secondly uh, is there a good evidence for what they say from the hadith from the Quran and for this reason I think the Shia community should be quite a lively community the scholars should be able to discuss things with each other if a scholar comes out and claims something other scholars are there to certainly say okay what is your evidence and why you say this, why you claim this and it's for the public to always listen to all these evidence and these uh, uh, different views and choose what is the best. Of course, I mean if there is a talented person who wants to misguide he can really really just uh, create a, a destruction and may really misguide many people. This has happened during the course of history. So we really have to seek refuge to God, not to be misguided. Yeah. Okay, we go to the sisters now. Thank you. Sisters, are you ready? No? Can you pass the mic to Sir Franz, please? Unless sisters are ready? No? Sir Franz? As 
Assalamualaikum. Haji Allah, you mentioned in the very early days of Imam Ismail alayhi salam, it was very confusing. Only the closest people even knew that he was born. Nobody else knew. What would the situation have been for people like us, just ordinary people? Where would they confu- where, what would they have done? Because they, you know, we say we have to know who our Imam is, otherwise we're, we're lost. Yeah, usually the people refer to scholars, certainly. I mean, as in many other issues that the people all around the uh, Muslim world, where there were Shias, there were scholars, people usually refer to those scholars, asking them, okay, what, what is our duty now? Who's the Imam? The important thing was to convince the scholars, not the lay people. Because lay people, of course, it was very difficult to somehow reach out to all of them. And the important job which these Nawab did, they convinced the majority of the scholars, if we don't say all of them, that they were the Nawab, the Imam was born, the Imam is in hiding, and after they were convinced, they conveyed the message to the people, and people followed them. And that's why we are here now. I mean, we are standing in this very firm position with regards to the Imam al And finally, there's one hadith that we've, we've heard before, Qadib al waqatun Mm. which says the one who places the Imam in time is a liar. Yeah. Not necessarily the one who places him in any other context. No, waqat means someone who, uh, who determines a time for the reappearance of the Imam. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so is that is more specific? Or because what you mentioned is anyone who even says they've met the Imam or seen the Imam. Well, that is not included in this hadith, but we had the other hadith which the Imam said, alayhi salam, very clearly, that whoever claims mushahada, he is a liar. So, waqat is different from someone who claims mushahada. Someone might say, I have not seen the Imam, but I know where the Imam is coming, for example. And who actually said this hadith, Qatib al I'm not sure. Uh, this is reported from Imam al-Mahdi, alayhi salam, as well. But I'm not sure about the chain and the, the source. Asan. Thank you. Um, Sisters, you got any questions, comments? No? Glumbay? Asalaamu Alaikum. I was just wondering, uh, because the last tawqi that you cited uh, that came to the fourth deputy six days before he passed away, and uh, you very well said that the ulama were very intelligent, they did not accept anything from anybody, they wanted evidence to see if the reply comes in the handwriting of the 11th Imam. Is there any documentation in circulation or available for us at this time to see, yes, certain replies from Imam did no. come? Yeah. No, nothing, no. Because you would not expect that these type of writings would have uh, somehow remained because they were very secret type of writings, they were kept very secretly and they were lost. I mean. There were earthquakes, people dying, not telling others where the letter is. So we just have the report of them in the books. We don't have the original letters or papers or something. So you can see that if people were confused then, where they could see the evidence probably, we, as somebody said, they're behind at this stage. Okay, we can have a judicious mind and think how it is. Very sad, most of our things are on hadith. Not that I'm disputing the hadith, but we do not have something. It's so sad that our Shia sect seems to have lost majority of not all of the evidence. No, for example, do you have a copy of the Quran written at the time of the Prophet? You don't have it. I mean, you don't need to have that first hand copy all the time to say, yes, this is the, the copy written at the time of the Prophet, so we compare everything to it. It is transferred to other copies, those are transferred to other copies, and this is how the knowledge actually carries on to go through the channel of time. And uh, therefore, here we have the same thing as well. We don't need that original letters. It's, it's what is important for us, and even if you see that original letter, how do you know that, that this, is, this is the letter written by Imam al-Askari or Imam al Imam Mahdi salam You don't know what their handwriting, the people who knew the handwriting are dead. And so you don't. It is more convincing to 
to see Saduq saying that this was the handwriting written. This is what was written in the handwriting. I confirm it, I accept it. Because my father, for example, has authorized this hadith and his sheikh has authorized it. It's more convincing just to have that piece of letter with us, not knowing where has it come from, what's its origin. So I think, no, we, are, we have good evidence now. I mean, we cannot really compare ourselves with the Shia of that time. We are in a very, very uh, much better position in terms of certainty, knowledge, comprehensiveness of what the Imams said, which were just scattered at that time. Uh, people did not dare to publish, did not dare to open this date. So we have a very better understanding, I think, at, that, at this time. Thank you, sisters. Yeah, we go to Sarfaz and then uh, Hamid and then we'll go to Taha. Alaykum salam. Thank you very much for your lecture. In the context, Sheikh, of um, meeting the Imam that you mentioned just at the end of the lecture, there were two aspects that I was wanting to uh, ask you about. One is that I've heard someone once mention that they saw the Imam in a dream. And, he, and they got direction or, or uh, advice. Is, it, is that something that we can accept? Because it doesn't quite fit in with the meeting the Imam or not meeting the Imam. Yeah, this, this is not, of course, the case of meeting. This is just a dream. Okay. And dreams might be right or wrong. Now, some people say that uh, uh, you cannot see... When, if you see uh, someone in your dream and you think that he's the prophet or the imam, or he's of thought, isn't it? Because otherwise we haven't seen them to compare, to see whether what we have seen is the imam or not. It's our thought, something which comes from an unknown consciousness in the dream that, yes, I've met Imam al-Asros, I've met the prophet. There's a hadith which says that whoever meets me in the dream has really met me because shaitan cannot somehow make himself in my face or something like that. This hadith, of course, is rejected by Sayyid Murtaza and Sheikh Mufid and others. They say this is not a reliable hadith, and therefore it's possible that people, not shaitan coming actually, people may see uh, someone in a dream, they may think that this is the Imam or the Prophet, but their thought is wrong. It's possible. However, there's other possibility that yes, really you, what you see in the dream might be a message coming from the Prophet or from the Imam, and you have seen a face which is uh, very similar to their face, it's possible, but uh, who can rely on a dream? I mean, it's only convincing for yourself yeah. if you see in the dream. No one else can really rely on the dream of other people, because uh, this dream business is very, very uh, vague. Sometimes the origin is quite unknown. Sometimes the messages come to you, it means something else, you see, because the dream is, uh, is a business of images coming, images having different meanings than what you see. So it's, it needs an interpreter, even what is said needs an interpreter to interpret. So, but it is possible, yeah, certainly it's possible. And the other aspect, and I could be talking in ignorance here, uh, I thought there was some mechanism whereby people believed that they could go to Samara for a certain number of days, do some du'as over those days, and end up meeting their Imam al Islam. Is that not correct? I hope so. I mean, you can try. <laughs> but it's not something that is well known as, as a process to go It's through. not something that our scholars practiced. That's what I know. Not something that our scholars practiced. And even... Uh, I mean, it might be something. I mean, you might, for 40 days, for example, or more than that, for a couple of months, three months, you go uh, do some very, very uh, long, for example, worship or something, and after 40 days or that, you just uh, see someone, you think, oh, he's the imam. Or, but what's the use of it? I mean, he's not going to tell you anything. He's not going to give you any guidance, any message. If it is, it's good. Uh, I do not deny, I do not want to dissuade anyone to do it, for doing this. And inshallah it would, it would work. But uh, 
we can do better things with that 40 days, certainly. Uh, we'll have Taha, and then if there is a question from the sister, then we'll go to the sister as the last one, Taha. Yep. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Can you just uh, clarify that the deputies, the four of them, were all Shias, and does that therefore mean, if that was the case, that Hussein ibn Mansur al-Hallaj was also a Shia? Yeah, Hussein ibn Mansur, many people say that he was a Shia, yes, and uh, some people say he was killed because he was a Shia, but uh, these people who claim deputyship, all of them were Shias, because how could you claim to be deputy of an imam while you don't have a standing in the Shia community? So they had a position in Shia community, that's why they could put forward the claim. And especially with the case of Shalmaghani, he was very prominent. Some, someone in the level of Hussein ibn Ruh, not less than him, says him. And that's why he, he dared to claim why Hussein ibn Ruh was there as the Naib, he dared to claim that I am the Naib. Uh, therefore, they were all Shias. About the, of course, the true uh, deputies, yes, there is no doubt, certainly they were Shias. How, how could they not be a Shia? It's just that uh, I recall at times it was propounded that some of them were not Shias, that uh, there were some, well, one of them was a Sunni. So. You have read it somewhere? Or? Somebody had mentioned this sometime. Yeah. If this is the case, this even shows they were even more clever than we thought. <laughs> that people thought they were Sunnis and they were deputies of the Imam. That shows how clever they could conceal all the issues. Yeah. Okay, any, uh, any sisters ready? No? Okay, Muhammad Wa Ali, Muhammad Salwa. Yeah, there is one question here, sir. Just okay, okay, we'll take this one. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, sir. Um, just a question. You, you mentioned that the Ghusl Kafan was done in, in private and then in public. Who, who led the prayer in the um, Salatul Salatu Mayat? In public or in private? In private, yeah. Imam Mahdi led the, the prayer, okay. even when he was five years old. Just like, for example, Yahya alayhi salam, where we are told in the Quran, Atayna Ulukma Sabiya. In public, uh, it was the caliph who should have, of course, led the, led the prayer. I'm not sure now uh, about who led the prayer in public, whether he was Jafar or he was. Uh, he was the caliph. I'm not sure now. 